welcome to Protea Valley Church at home. I'm Brent, I'm one of the crew that helps lead this congregation of God's people. And it's really great that you've joined us at home watching online. Of course, we understand that you can't watch church. In fact, you can't even do church or go to church. We really believe you are to be the church. And so if at all possible, we'd love you to come join us at 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. here in this building where this church meets uh, the church then gathers to sing God's praises, to listen to the scriptures read and preached, and then to go out and to be on mission together for Jesus' fame. So please uh, do connect with us, uh, connect with us either on our social media platforms or on our website, uh, proteavalleychurch.org. Uh, this is a snippet out of last Sunday. It's the teaching and preaching component of the service. We really hope that it's of service to you, that it would edify you, that it would bless you, that it would equip you to go and be a Jesus follower this week. So let me pray and then let's get to the teaching. Father, Son and Spirit, thank you so much for the beauty of your word. Thank you that we can hear it read and preached to us. I pray that our hearts would be open to hear what it is you would say and that your word would transform us and change us so that we would look more like you day after day after day, Jesus. So come Holy Spirit, sharpen our hearing, and then sharpen our lives so that we might be an influence in the world for Jesus' sake. And so we ask this in his beautiful name. Amen. Let's listen to last Sunday's teaching. This morning's readings come from Leviticus 19 verses 33 to 37, and Romans 13, verses 1 to 10. When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner resides among you, the foreigner who resides among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Do not use dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or quantity. Use honest scales and honest weights, an honest effer and an honest hen. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Keep all my decrees and all my laws and follow them. I am the Lord. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be, are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Thanks, Dallas. So this morning's sermon, this morning's topic is a very challenging one, um, and it's controversial. I know I've been nervous preparing for it because it is so divisive. But as the church, that's exactly why we need to talk about these topics. Topic of immigration, topic of undocumented immigration in particular, has been the cause of many heated debates. Many political campaigns have been based on it, both in South Africa and across the world. And the church has too often steered away from these difficult topics, not wanting to rock the boat, but as the church, we're called to be salt and light to the world, to bring God's kingdom, God's love to the world. We've been set apart by God in order to be sent back into the world 
to bring God's love, to bring salt. And although laws are, are good, many laws just don't make sense. I think most teenage boys would be arrested in Malawi. In Malawi, it's illegal to pass wind. <laughs> it's also illegal in Florida, but only on Thursdays in public after six. Love to know how that law came about. I would definitely be arrested in Russia. In Russia, it's illegal to drive a dirty car. But there is a law I really do like, and that's in Samoa. In Samoa, it's illegal to forget your wife's birthday. <laughs> Doesn't say anything about the husband's birthday. The law is a strange thing. We love laws that protect us, laws that give us justice when we've been wronged. But we're not so keen on laws that limit us, laws that make it difficult for us to do business or laws that are costly to us if we make an innocent mistake. If laws were simple, if they were consistent, if we all agreed with them, we wouldn't need lawyers and advocates. So law is a strange thing, but it's also an important thing because it protects us, it guides us. Scripture contains many verses, chapters, even books that contain nothing but laws. And some of them sound as strange as the ones I've shared. And not only does scripture contain a whole bunch of laws, it also teaches that we should respect the law, that we should obey it. Even laws not contained in scripture. Paul writes to the Romans that everyone should be subject to the governing authorities and submit to the authorities. It's also written in Hebrews that we should have confidence in leaders and submit to their authority. But that does not mean that we should blindly follow the law. Scripture does not say that we should obey it in all circumstances. There are many examples in Scripture that calls for disobedience to the law especially when the laws are unjust, when they contradict God's ultimate law. For example, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to bow down to the golden idol. They were thrown into the fire for disobeying the law. In Acts, the apostles were arrested for teaching about Jesus. And when questions, they said, we will obey God's law, not human law. Even Jesus broke the law. He healed on the Sabbath, socialized with Samaritans, and he took mercy on the woman caught in adultery. Ultimately, he was crucified for disobeying the law. So this leaves us with a challenge. Scripture is clear on the one hand that we should uphold the law, but it's also clear that there are circumstances when we should disobey it. So how do we know when to disobey the law and when to uphold it? Well, we look at scripture and there are really two reasons which calls for disobedience to the law. First, if a law is asking us to worship someone or something other than God. And second, when laws are unjust or unloving. Basically, when the law contradicts God's ultimate law, that we should love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love others as yourself. If a law contradicts God's ultimate law, then we should disobey it. So we discern good laws from bad laws based on whether it upholds or contradicts this ultimate law. So laws that contradict God's ultimate law, laws that protect the powerful, exploit the vulnerable, laws that oppress, that cause harm, laws that are hateful, laws that kill. There are many examples of laws like this. From our own history, the apartheid laws, the Group Areas Act and, acts that, and laws that oppress people based on the color of their skin. On the other hand, there are many laws that uphold God's ultimate law, laws that are just, righteous, 
laws that protect the vulnerable, laws that are compassionate, merciful, laws that protect life. For example, forced labor, slavery, it's illegal. It's illegal to neglect and abuse children. It's illegal to steal and to kill. These are laws that support God's ultimate law. But it isn't always easy to discern between good and bad laws, between whether a law upholds or contradicts God's law. And as a church, we need to be bringing a gospel perspective. We need to be grappling with these issues. We need to be seeing them in the face of God's ultimate law. And immigration is one of these topics. It's one of those topics that really sparks debates. If you want an interesting Sunday braai, just bring up the to topic, sit back and enjoy your popcorn. Everyone seems to have an opinion. And I know there are people here this morning with different opinions. There are those that believe that employing an undocumented immigrant is wrong because it's against the law. There are those that believe that immigrants are putting unnecessary strain on an already strained economy. People who believe that we should have stronger immigration laws and take a strong stand against immigrants who are living and working here illegally. But there are also those who believe that we should love and care for the undocumented immigrant, that the laws are wrong, that we should offer love, protection, and jobs to the immigrants. And I know many of you vacillate between all these positions, struggling to discern a gospel response. But importantly, there are undocumented immigrants here this morning people who call Protea Valley Church home, people we love, people who are our brothers and sisters. They're our family. So I wanna be sensitive to the views of all of these different groups, but also to cut to the heart of the issue. Although there isn't a simple, easy solution, I'm gonna to try to bring a gospel perspective. So what is the situation in South Africa? Well, there are between three and four million immigrants living in South Africa. And in the late 90s, we had quite liberal asylum-seeking um, laws where asylum seekers were allowed to live and work in South Africa. But over the years, these laws have become increasingly restrictive. Most recently, the, Zim the Zimbabwean exemption permits were withdrawn which means that people, Zimbabweans living and working in South Africa, now have until next year to leave the country or face deportation. And the law isn't the only worry for immigrants. Many face constant hatred and prejudice from South Africans. It ranges from name calling to violence, looting, and even killing. I can remember the tragic xenophobic attacks of 2008, where many people lost their lives and many thousands lost their homes. And in recent months, we've seen again an increasing amount of violence, xenophobic violence. Operation Dudula, which started as a social media campaign, has now become an instigator for violence against immigrants, including looting, arson, and even murder. A few ladies from our congregation were riding in a taxi, and they were accosted by a group of gun-wielding South Africans saying, looking for the foreigners to take back the money. These ladies counted themselves lucky because all they took was their money. Even in their workplaces, immigrants face hardship. Because they have to work, they don't have access to social grants and other services. They take on jobs that are precarious, jobs that pay below the minimum wage, jobs that do not give them protection of labor laws. They take on dangerous jobs, long hours. Immigrants face hardship, oppression, 
and danger from all sides. The law offers them no protection, they're hated by locals and abused by their employers. So just go back home. It's a cry from many South Africans. Why would someone live in a country like South Africa if you've got these conditions? Go home. But if you listen to the stories of immigrants, they tell painful stories of why they left their native countries. All of them had to make painful decisions to leave family, familiar surroundings in order to provide for themselves and their families. Many left children with sisters and mothers. They've had to make the impossible decision for the sake of their children. Time and distance making them increasingly strangers to their own family. They send, family, send money home every month, but don't get to see their children growing up. It's a heart-wrenching, difficult situation for immigrants in South Africa and all across the world. And it's pretty clear that this treatment of immigrants, laws that marginalize, are contrary to God's ultimate law. God's law says that we should care for the vulnerable, the meek, the poor. And throughout scripture, we see how God protects the immigrants. And he calls us to look after the alien, the foreigner, the stranger, the other. What's more, throughout scripture, we see how God works through immigrants to fulfill his purposes. We see him work through Abraham and Sarah, Moses, Joseph, Ruth. He works through all of these immigrants to fulfill his purposes. And not in a way that says, yeah, you can stay here, but only if you don't work and only if you don't earn a living. No, he gave these immigrants jobs. He gave them work to do in order to fulfill his purposes. Abraham was called to foreign lands so that he and his children would be a blessing to all the nations. He used Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt through foreign lands into the edge of the promised land. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. He rose up in the foreign land, worked for the king, and became a person of powerful position. He used that powerful position eventually to save the brothers who had sold him into slavery. Ruth, treated much like immigrants in this country, marginalized, ostracized. But even then, Israel had a law where you had to provide for the immigrants. She was able to glean, she was able to collect food from farms. God did not limit what immigrants could do while in foreign countries. He used immigrants for his purposes. Jesus himself showed care to immigrants. He showed compassion and caring to Samaritans, the most hated immigrants. And we are effectively aliens and immigrants, aliens and immigrants in God's kingdom. We have no rights or paperwork to be here. We haven't earned our way in, but Jesus died for us. Dying on the cross, he signed our paperwork. Being rose again, he made us citizens of God's kingdom. We are immigrants who have been welcomed into God's kingdom. And because God has given us welcome into his kingdom, we are told throughout scripture to welcome and care for the immigrant. It is in fact the second most repeated command in scripture after to love, your, love God with all your heart. And in Deuteronomy, one of God's laws is that we should not take advantage of foreign workers, that we should pay them wages before the sun sets. It's clear from passages like this that caring for the immigrant is more than just giving them handouts. Caring for them is giving them the ability to fulfill their, for God's purposes through them by giving them work. Work gives dignity, it gives independence, 
and it gives you the ability to fulfill God's purposes. Laws that prevent immigrants from working contradicts God's laws. Jesus didn't give us conditional entry to God's kingdom. He gives us unconditional welcome. He doesn't say God's kingdom is only for godly people, like we say South Africa is only for South Africans. And our South Africa for South Africans attitude exposes a deeper issue, that we are not worshiping God with all our heart, mind, and soul. It reflects an attitude of fundamental nationalism, like make America great again. We worship our identity as South Africans, wanting the best for South Africans at the expense of those who are not South African, those who are other, outsiders. This is idolatry. It's worshiping a national identity ahead of our identity in Christ. It's worshiping politics ahead of God. God tells us to worship only him, that we are citizens of heaven, a new people, a people of God. There's no place for a South Africa first attitude. Now this does not mean that we shouldn't have borders, that we shouldn't have laws that protect South Africans. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't protect the interests of South Africa. Even in scripture we see that there were nations, there were national borders. The people of Israel were a nation. But they were a nation in order to be a blessing to all the nations. The borders were there to protect them from invasion. Brent always says that the problem isn't, it, the problem is when good things become ultimate things. Having a national identity is a good thing, but when it becomes an ultimate thing, that's when it leads to hatred, prejudice, violence. That's when our national identity becomes our ultimate identity. And the other reason that I hear people have a South Africa first attitude is a fear of scarcity. A fear that there isn't enough to go around. There aren't enough jobs. There isn't enough food. There isn't enough housing. Because of these fears, we need to exclude people protect jobs, protect housing for South Africans. We fear not having enough. But this fear is rooted in our belief that we are our own creators, that we are our own providers, rather than God. We trust in our provision, not God's provision. We don't trust in God's abundance, that God will use the immigrants to multiply to create more jobs, to create more food. We instead fear that it will diminish it, reduce what is available. A fear of scarcity contradicts God's ultimate law. And it seems pretty clear that the way immigrants are treated in South Africa contradicts God's ultimate law. And as the church, we can't just grab our popcorn can't just watch from the sidelines. It's not good enough just to have an opinion. We need to respond. So I'm gonna suggest three ways in which we as a church can respond. The first is to show unconditional love and welcome to the immigrants. Show love, compassion. Just as Jesus has shown us unconditional love, he didn't say only if you've got a scarce skill or only if you've got a really big investment will you be allowed into the God's kingdom. It's unconditional. There is nothing we have, nothing we can give Jesus that he needs, yet he still gives us unconditional love and welcome. And we need to show that same unconditional love and welcome to immigrants. Include them as your brothers and sisters in communities. Welcome them into your homes. Show hospitality. Love, give them jobs where they are treated well, cared for. And the second, pray. Pray for immigrants. 
pray for their protection, for provision, for welcome, and for opportunities for fulfill their, to fulfill their purpose. But also pray that they will honor the laws of the country, they will seek to get documentation, that they will seek to change their legal status, and pray for the situations in their native countries that compelled them to come here. Pray for peace. Pray for renewal. Pray for restoration. Pray for employers. Pray that they will be protected when they employ immigrants. Pray that they will treat immigrants well. Pay them living wages care for them and their families. And pray for South Africans living in fear. Pray for those who are responding in violence. Pray for reconciliation, softening of hearts. And pray for the policymakers. Pray that they'll make just laws that show merciful treatment. Pray for wisdom, discernment. Which leads to the final point. As the church, we need to be the prophetic voice. We can't just stand back and say, the law's unjust. We actually have a very good judicial system. We can't simply open our borders and have a free for all. But how these laws are written, how they are enforced, means the difference between making them laws of compassion, mercy, and care and laws grounded in hatred and fear. As the church, we need to make our voice heard. We should speak out against laws that degrade, that isolate immigrants. Speak out against laws that protect one group at the expense of another. Speak out against laws that are rooted in fear and in prejudice. And this does not mean that we should take to social media and troll people with different opinions to ourselves. It means getting involved in organizations that are supporting and helping immigrants, organizations that are advocating for government, for a change in laws. Now, being the prophetic voice and advocating for change, not everyone is called to do that. But if you do feel called, if you do want to get involved, please come and speak to myself or Grant, and we can put you in touch with organizations that are making a difference, that are helping immigrants, that are advocating for government to change the laws. These messages are not difficult, are not easy to, to receive. They're often difficult. But when we look to how God has loved us, how God has welcomed us into his kingdom, how he's called us his family, given us board in the Father's kingdom. We've got nothing to offer God. It's from that point that we offer unconditional love and welcome to immigrants. Even more so Jesus, he became an immigrant, he lived among us, he took on human flesh, and he welcomed us home into his home. If Jesus gave us spiritual refugees, place in his home, he gave us unconditional love and welcome. How more so should we for immigrants? The gospel isn't meant to just shape our inner lives. It's meant to shape our world. So as the people of God, as Jesus' church, we need to welcome the vulnerable, the excluded. And as Jesus' church, we need to be the church for the immigrants because we too were immigrants once. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have shown us unconditional welcome. We are unworthy, undeserving, yet you threw open the gates of heaven. You died for us so that we could never be immigrants again, Lord. And I just pray that we'll respond to immigrants living among us with love, with care, with compassion that we will show them protection and your love. And as immigrants, we pray for encouragement that your love for us as immigrants 
we just pray for the immigrants living among us, that they will same, feel that same encouragement, that same love, Lord. I pray that we will have the courage and conviction to be the voice for your laws, Lord. And we pray this all in your awesome name. Amen. Friends, I hope that was a blessing to you. Again, we'd love you to plug in and connect to us and to be the church rather than just watching church. And so head to our website, www.proteavalleychurch.org, and you will find all of the relevant information there. We'd love to help plug you into a midweek community. We'd love to help you come and gather with us on Sunday mornings. We'd love to help find a space for you to serve. One of the ways that you can start serving right now is to scan the code now for SnapScan. We'd love you to partner with us. Ministry costs money. We fund a whole bunch of international missionaries around the world who are taking the good news to the nations. We have absolutely loads of phenomenal life transforming local ministries in various places in our neighborhoods, in local townships, uh, through other organizations who we partner with. And we would love you to partner with us. And that out of your money, we would see fruit, a harvest for Jesus kingdom. So please do scan that code and partner with us as we seek to see Jesus made famous amongst the nations here and right to the very ends of the earth. I pray that you have a great week worshiping Jesus and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God who is our heavenly father and the friendship and fellowship of Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Go in peace and serve Jesus this week well. Amen.